So as Alan kindly introduced me, I'm affiliated with the Medical University of uh, Lublin in southeastern Poland. And currently I'm also serving as Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medical University um, of this um, university. And uh, I'm immediate past president of European Academy of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology. I'm also European Director of International Association of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology. Unfortunately, our Congress in Korea and South Korea in two weeks time, it will be hybrid. So only Korean delegates will be on site and all international guests will be on site online. So I will have a pleasure to chair a session, keynote session uh, with Sharon Brooks. However, it will be 2 a.m. in Poland so that the Korean delegates can hear the speech at 9 a.m. Uh, Korean time. I'm also uh, active in a Polish association, so I'm vice president of a Polish dental association, and this is the logo of a Polish medical radiological society as I'm medical radiologist. So dental maxillofacial radiology in general is on the crossroads of dentistry and radiology. And maybe this makes the MFR so complex because uh, on one hand, uh, when you deal with it, you need all the knowledge related to dental pathology, but at the same time, the skills of radiologists to find out what's in the bone. And uh, that is why um, CBCT, um, so CBCT uh, related to teeth uh, is easier to be reported for dentists and medical radiologists because the dentist possess all the knowledge on teeth pathologies and teeth supporting structures. Uh, but large field of view CBCTs that demonstrate you uh, bone in larger extent than just alveolar process, maxillary sinuses, TMJs, uh, temporal bone, uh, pharynx, um, etc. Uh, it's uh, much easier for a medical radiologist to report because they are trained to uh, look at the lesions in the bone, but uh, mostly they do not have to extensive knowledge on dental pathology. And uh, I can see that at least in Poland for my colleagues, medical radiologists, everything which is located at the apex of the tooth, it must be a radicular cyst. Everything which is a tumor in a mandible, it must be ameloblastoma, there is no other tumor. And for example, extraction sockets uh, can be reported as uh, cancer infiltration because uh, there is not enough uh, knowledge to ask the patient when did you have your third molar extracted. Okay, so um, moving on with my presentation, as you uh, know uh, the progress in uh, the implant placements has been immense, especially over the few past years. But uh, the first attempts were done already in uh, back in the 1970s, and I found uh, this interesting panoramic radiograph, uh, which uh, shows us very well how far we are from these first attempts. First of all, the quality of imaging diagnostics is uh, much different from uh, what you can see in this picture. And uh, when looking at this strange uh, architecture of uh, implants and uh, prosthesis supporting structures, uh, you are aware uh, how uh, we progressed uh, from that uh, point. And uh, for implant placement, as Alan mentioned, uh, in fact, uh, CBCT has recently become a gold standard. Maybe it's not implemented very uh, clearly in the guidelines yet that it's the golden standard, but uh, when you judge from clinical practice, there is no other way. And um, of course, uh, until CBCT was introduced, uh, dentist based on 2D radiographs and also on medical uh, CTs. However, already 20 years ago, Stu White, on behalf of the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, stated that a single panoramic image is not sufficient in preoperative assessment of implant sites. And here in 2021, I'm sure everyone agrees with this statement. Because in plain radiography, 
uh, we obtain images of three-dimensional structures, but in two-dimensional images. So in order to be able to uh, locate um, a lesion uh, or measure uh, the bone, we need at least two radiographs, which are ideally taken at 90 degrees at right angle, uh, one to another. And so if not, so we are misled because, uh, for example, here, the lady is holding a pineapple and a banana, but in this anterior posterior view, all you can see is the shadow of a banana and the shadow of a pineapple is completely hidden in the shadow of a lady. So we don't know that she's holding this pineapple and this piece of information is missed. And when you take the second uh, projection, which is a lateral view, now you can see the pineapple very clearly, but the banana is hidden in the shadow of the lady. So this is also uh, why radiology uh, needs skills, visual skills and imagination, uh, because from these 2D uh, radiographs, uh, we have to derive uh, information on 3D location of uh, lesions. And um, in uh, 2002, European Association for Osteointegration published their first guidelines on uh, use of imaging diagnostics in um, implant planning. And at that time, CVCT was not mentioned at all. Why? Of course, the first machines were presented in Japan and in Italy back in 1998. But in 2002, they were definitely not widespread and uh, treated a little bit uh, of a curiosity. I remember that when I first saw a CVCT machine, I really wanted to have it in the um, dental uh, radiology, but uh, at the time dental radiology was a part of a big clinical hospital. So when we applied to the manager of, of the hospital and he said, what's, what's that? This is a CT just for teeth. I can buy a CT, medical CT, and this was, will serve all my patients in the hospital and not just the dentist. So we have to wait for a while until we got the first CBCT uh, machine. And uh, the conditions uh, have been changing so fast that uh, in 2011, during a workshop in Poland in the Ahramka, uh, in the members of uh, the Board of European Association of uh, Osteo Integration prepared the second version of the guidelines. These guidelines are quite conscious because uh, they are saying that the choice of imaging methods should be based on specific needs of a patient and depends on treatment methods. Uh, they were also saying that availability of imaging methods influences the choice, which means that at that time they accepted that if CBCT was not available, medical CT could still be used. However, now in 2021, I would say that medical CT is no longer used in implant planning because CBCT is so accessible uh, to dental uh, patients. And um, the guidelines uh, from 2011 uh, presented a flowchart uh, for CBCT use. So when patient attends for CBCT, you must consider patient size, age, and uh, sex. Of course, uh, taking into account that uh, younger patients and females are slightly more susceptible to potential harmful effects of X radiation than older age groups. On the other hand, in dental implantology, we do not scan children. It's adults and um, also we focus on older age groups in whom uh, the effects of radiation are not that pronounced anymore when you compare it with pediatric uh, population. Uh, patient size must be taken into account as well because uh, as you are aware, uh, the exposure parameters for the scan must be adapted to patient's size. Uh, we cannot reduce um, the exposure parameters uh, to a large male uh, who's coming to us saying that he's so very scared of X radiation, could you please give me just a tiny dose? Of course, it will not be valid because the, um, the obtained um, examination 
will not have enough diagnostic quality if exposure parameters were too low. So we have to follow the ALADA rule, the ALADA rule, uh, and the ALADA IP rules, uh, which uh, uh, are modifications of the original as slow as reasonably achievable rule. Now we are saying as low as diagnostically acceptable and uh, patient orientated, indication orientated. So we keep the dose as low as possible, but we must be reasonable and take into consideration indications for the study and uh, the size of the patient. This is very important because uh, I tend to observe that uh, doctors want to have a complete picture, a large picture, and uh, they are uh, sometimes overusing larger fields of view. I always uh, ask to go for the smallest possible field of view. If it's one or two implants to be planned, do not use for you go for 20 by 20 uh, centimeters field of view. This way, with small field of view, you on one hand uh, decrease the risk, radiation risk to the patient because of less radiation required to obtain the volume. And then also usually a smaller field of view is related to higher uh, image uh, resolution, which is especially important in endodontics. Uh, when you go through you know, the guidelines uh, of uh, uh, endodontic uh, societies, it will be repeated like a mantra. Small field of view, high resolution CBCD. Small field of view, high resolution CBCD. What about the resolution for uh, implant planning? It depends. If you need uh, this scan also for evaluation of dental related factors, then you go for normal dose protocol. Uh, if you need to export data sets to an external software for implant planning, for CADCAM, etc., also go for normal dose protocol. But if you need it just for implant planning, not for other reasons, you can try low dose protocols uh, with um, reduction of dose area product, which is the entry dose of x-rays on uh, area of skin. Uh, reduce uh, milliampers, uh, so tube current, lower number of projections, use partial rotation instead of full rotation of a tube around a patient's head, and reduce scan time. And so uh, from these guidelines, I also derived this table, which uh, compares different imaging modalities for dental pathology, jawbone pathology, bone structure and density, shape and contour, anatomical landmarks, and probably last but not least, the measurements. So just compare panoramic radiography, which is so widespread with cone beam CT. And this is the major drawback of panoramic radiography. It will never provide you the buccal lingual dimension of alveolar process. And for mesial distal uh, dimensions, of course, you can perform the measurements, but you must remember that panoramic radiographs are prone to distortions in the image. And then these distortions are larger in horizontal plane than in vertical plane, so they are not reliable. And CBCT is most reliable in all these cases. And when we compare medical CT to CBCT, they are really comparable uh, for, for measurements, uh, for bone shape and downline, for uh, data exports to external software for implant planning, but taking into account those, which is uh, at least tenfold higher in medical CT than in CBCT, uh, then uh, we definitely support use of cone beam in dental practice. So this is an example of a patient aged uh, 37 years and uh, the plants implant, just a single implant for the first lower left molar missing. And um, when you look at just TD, 2D um, pan panoramic, 
Uh, it seems that the site for implant planning is perfect. There is very good heights of uh, the alveolar process. Uh, you can see uh, the mandibular canal very clearly. So why not go for uh, implant placement? However, when we um, assess uh, the structure of the bone, it looks somewhat radiolucent. And a small field of view uh, was done in this patient. So, so in a tangential view, the structure of uh, sponges bone is fine, but still uh, it's radiolucency in this area. And it's explained by cross-sectional images. So in this area, towards the alveolar ridge, uh, the buccal lingual dimension of the bone is smaller. So the height is very good. This corresponds to the height you can see in 2D uh, picture as well. But at this level, there is less bone to uh, attenuate X-ray beam. Therefore, we've got radiolucency. Okay, this alveolar process is still fine enough uh, for a pl placement of a narrow implant. However, in some cases, the alveolar ridge is very narrow and uh, the two-dimensional radiographs uh, may be very misleading uh, in implant uh, planning. However, it can be, uh, you know, the other way around. In this case, I was asking why. Why did this patient um, have uh, this uh, uh, CBCT? Uh, because uh, in uh, this case, uh, there's hardly any bone uh, in uh, right maxilla for implant placement. Of course, there's uh, some kind of septum, which is quite wide, I would say, for a septum in uh, maxillary sinus. But this is not enough to support uh, one implant. And uh, the uh, other parts of alveolar uh, process are atrophic with a height of 2.5 millimeters. Uh, you cannot place an implant so you talk to your patient and you tell your patient okay um, I'm sorry but I know that you came from the UK to Poland to Lublin in Poland a direct flight from London Luton airport to Lublin Świdnik airport in the times before COVID and uh, you, you wanted to dedicate one week um, to dental treatment in Poland and return to the UK with a uh, immediate loading of implants, but I'm sorry, in this case, there is no bone, you need sinus lift procedure. It will take uh, time to heal with a new bone. And I will see you back in uh, like a half a year for uh, the rest of the uh, treatment. And then the patient says, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't afford that. So this is more costly than I expected. This will take more time than I expected. So I will stick to my, um, to my um, prosthetic appliance. So this POC could have been done after taking just panoramic radiograph because in this uh, aspect, it says the same, there is hardly any bone because there is the height of a bone, alveolar bone in right maxilla is very small. There is the septum and uh, the, the treatment plan was not changed by doing this small field of view uh, CBCT. So, uh, of course, we are saying that CBCT <clears throat> is a gold standard uh, in uh, uh, implant placement. However, 2D uh, is still recommended as initial diagnostics, for example, by American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. Um, today we are talking about CBCT. I have a, sec a different topic uh, recently that I <clears throat> de uh, delivered uh, like to my colleagues in Poland. And the issue of my other topic, topic is, will CBCT replace uh, panoramic radiography and the conclusion from my talk is that um, now that we take both uh, panoramics and CBCTs, uh, we can see that in so many cases panoramics just lie to us and uh, CBCTs tell us the truth. Okay, so uh, before we can start implant planning, we need to have a look at normal anatomy in CBCT because without knowledge on normal anatomy, we are not able to pick up what's wrong. And um, 
I we will go through some anatomical structures that are important in implant planning. And I'm sorry, I'm, I need from time to time, <clears throat> I need to uh, drink a little of my tea because I deliver a lot of lectures and by uh, Saturday, um, my, my throat is quite tired. So uh, we'll start uh, with nasopalatine ducts and incisive foramen, uh, which is uh, a kind of a remnant um, from the fetal period of life. And it connects uh, nasal cavity uh, with uh, the oral cavity with incisive foramen, uh, which is located on the palatal side of central incisors. And so uh, in normal conditions, uh, we can observe variability of uh, the system of uh, nasopalatine ducts and incisive foramens. In this case, one foramen, but as many as uh, three. Ducts. Uh, usually it's not one foramen and two ducts leading to the floor of a nasal cavity with openings in uh, the inferior nasal passage. Sometimes it's a single uh, foramen and single ducts. And um, often in occlusal radiographs and in axial CBCT slices, it looks like a heart. It's heart shaped. So around uh, Valentine's Day uh, in different uh, radiological websites, uh, blogs, etc., you can see a lot of uh, pictures of uh, these uh, incisive foramina because they are heart shaped. And um, the incisive foramen can have different size from a small one, uh, sometimes not visible at all, uh, to large ones. And uh, if we are talking about the foramen, which is over six millimeters in diameter, then we should diagnose um, a cyst, incisive um, the, uh, foramen cyst or nasopalatine duct cyst. And of course, cysts must be treated by surgery because they will keep on progressing. But even if it's not a cyst, but um, like in this case, uh, even if it's not a cyst, if uh, incisive foramen is quite large, the um, uh, limit for normal incisive foramen is up to six millimeters. So even if it's uh, this way, then uh, it uh, can uh, still reduce uh, the size of um, the alveolar process available for implant planning. So you must take this anatomical structure into consideration. And <clears throat> there's one case, one more case of uh, nasopalatine duct cyst. Uh, it looks like, uh, like scalloped. Uh, it seems that originally there were three nasopalatine ducts and the cyst uh, appeared in all three of them. Then uh, when taking into account measurements of alveolar process, we also have to take into consideration nasal cavity. And um, <clears throat> maybe the size of nasal cavity is not as variable as size of maxillary sinus, but still anatomical variants uh, can be found. And uh, it's really difficult to observe a patient with perfectly straight nasal septum. Instead, most of the patients have uh, deviations of the septum to one side, uh, possibly <clears throat> uh, with uh, deviations also in the horizontal plane, not only coronal plane, asymmetry of the concha, so this is inferior concha on the left side, right inferior concha, and the middle turbinate uh, can um, uh, present with internal air cells, uh, which are called concabulosa, and uh, maybe inflamed as well. So uh, some of the uh, images in CBCT can be misleading. So uh, in this case, for example, on this axial view, uh, the, the arrow points uh, to a structure which looked suspicious and it was nothing else but also nasal cavity. But to be sure you need a complete picture, you have to revise all the slices, not just one single uh, slice. So here it's the explanation. So in the axial slice, we could see just one cross section and this is um, 
uh, opacified uh, right maxillary sinus. And this cross section was done on this level. So it demonstrated both maxillary sinus and a little bit of a nasal uh, cavity. For the uh, nasal lacrimal ducts, uh, it can also be visible in um, <clears throat> uh, CBCT. And if any pathology is related to it, it can be observed as uh, well. And so, <clears throat> And the previous uh, image which showed you nasal cavity, while a little bit higher up and more to the front, similar image, but this is nasal lacrimal duct. Um, coronal images uh, are very good to demonstrate uh, the, this, this duct that connects internal canthus of the eye with a nasal cavity and the role of this canal is of course to eliminate the surplus of produced uh, tears. <clears throat> now, um, going through the anatomy of a uh, maxillofacial uh, skeleton, we cannot underestimate uh, maxillary sinuses. On one hand, when you perform cone beam CT, and the sinuses are within your field of view, uh, you also have to report the findings in the sinuses. There is uh, always ongoing talk what to do with these findings, because uh, if we report, if we send all the patients to head and uh, neck specialists, to ENT uh, specialist surgeons, they will not be doing anything else but uh, treating the patients, dental patients. So not every single finding in maxillary sinus must be treated, but it is my responsibility of um, radiologists to report if there is any causal thickening. And moreover, uh, this is a very important issue. Um, I do not write um, exactly that this is mucosal thickening. I'm not very sure in some cases because cone beam CT cannot differentiate between mucosa, which is thickened, and some kind of infiltration like a, a tumor as well. So if we have any lesions in sinuses, we do have to report them but not every patient must be referred for treatment. And of course, a second uh, important issue regarding uh, the maxillary sinuses is uh, the implant planning, because the floor of maxillary sinus is crucial in implant planning and posterior maxilla. And um, I must say that maxillary sinus can be very, very different as um, it uh, pre it presents a wide variety of anatomical vari variants from hypertrophic maxillary sinuses, rarely atrophic rather in patients with congenital uh, anomalies, like um, for example, cladocranial dysplasia, um, to uh, sinuses which are extensively um, pneumatized and uh, we've got like large anterior recesses, for example. In this case, um, uh, there is a, a, an anterior recess of maxillary sinus reaching under the floor of the nasal cavity and going all the way to the canine upper right canine. So I bet usually when you're thinking about implant placement in anterior maxilla, you would not expect maxillary sinus in this area. So this patient does have uh, the teeth in, the, in this area. However, they are missing uh, clinical crowns. Maybe in future they will be extracted. The patient will need uh, implant uh, treatment and the sinus will be all the way to the front and the maxilla. So uh, there's one more uh, slice demonstrating this close relationship between canine, a palatal side of the root and uh, maxillary sinus anterior recess. Another risk is that uh, when uh, patients um, um, demonstrate such radiolucency around apex of uh, anterior tooth, uh, it may be um, mixed uh, with a cyst 
and uh, sometimes teeth uh, extracted unnecessarily on basis on 2D uh, examination. So 3D is most helpful in um, explaining such uh, issues. And this is um, another case of a large maxillary sinus. In this case, um, the alveolar processes are filled with uh, recesses of maxillary sinus. And uh, before the onset of the CBCT, it was a widespread um, statement that following extraction of teeth, uh, alveolar process goes atrophic. Okay, I agree, it does, because uh, if there are no teeth, there is no reason for the bone to be supported by the organism. But the other part of the statement said that maxillary sinus quickly enters uh, this residual alveolar ridge and uh, alveolar recess is formed. Now, there was a very interesting uh, study performed by Michael Bornstein, and um, he proved quite the contrary, that um, there are sinuses uh, which already pneumatize very deep in alveolar processes, like in this case, this is farcation, of a first upper left molar, and it's filled with <clears throat> hair, not with bone. And once this tooth is extracted, there will be no bone, hardly any bone, because the sinus was here already. So now, uh, we I'm not saying anymore that uh, maxillary sinus uh, is the one capable of growing uh, in, in um, the adult uh, period of life. No, uh, it's just large in some patients. And in other patients, it can be quite the other way around. So, uh, surprise, I remember this lady. Uh, she was almost completely edentulous in the maxilla for a long time. And I thought, OK, uh, this will be short. Uh, there will be no implant planning because she will have no bone. And that's a surprise for me, because in this lady, maxillary sinuses were hypotrophic. So the level of um, the floor of maxillary sinus is higher than the floor of uh, nasal cavity. And the alveolar processes were very fine in maxilla for implant placement. But it was, of course, the opposite in the mandible. As you can see here, the alveolar ridge is atrophic with two, three millimeters of the bone and just a very sharp pointed ridge on the right side. Another issue of uh, nutritive canals, uh, in the, especially in the mandible, but also in the maxilla. I'm sure everyone knows the lingual canal, which is the most constant nutritive canal uh, in the mandible. It's in the midline, so it does not really interfere with any implant placement, but I'm showing it because sometimes uh, when I teach, doctors are surprised that there is a structure like that. It, of course, depends on your background and how much um, dental maxillofacial radiology was taught during your uh, dental curriculum in pregraduate treatment or in residency, a postgraduate uh, treatment. So this link well for Amen is also available uh, to be seen in uh, periapicals of anterior incisors in the mandible and also in panoramics. And the canal uh, mostly runs horizontal or slightly oblique. So uh, together with uh, the main central X-ray beam for uh, panoramic or periapical radiograph. So in radiographs, it looks like a ring because the walls of the canal overlap. But I'm just giving you the lingual canal as an example. And um, you can see from this interesting study by American colleagues that in over 4,000 CBCT scans, they found accessory canals in 1,737 scans, which is over 40%. And majority of these canals were found in the mandible. So if there is a canal like that, and if it's injured during implant placement, it can also 
produce bleeding. And these canals can be found mostly on the lingual side of the mandible, but not necessarily so. In this case, one was found um, on the uh, buccal side, vestibular side of uh, left uh, mandibular uh, body. And so here's uh, the location of uh, different accessory canals. They can be found in maxilla and mandible. And as I told you, the lingual canal, uh, they can be multiple. And uh, also uh, there can be the canals around the molars opening on the buccal side, as well as accessory mental foramina. And this is especially important in implant placements. Uh, when we've got uh, uh, nutritive canals piercing the bone, like in this case, um, we uh, have to remember uh, about the possibility of their existence, because otherwise they can be quite confused uh, with uh, fractures of the bone. So that's another example of nutritive canal and on cross-sectional view, uh, you can see how tiny it is, but uh, how well CBCT can demonstrate it. Uh, what else uh, can we observe from uh, anatomical um, landmarks like epiglottis, for example? Uh, in the larger field of view, it can be seen um, cast against the air shadow of uh, the pharynx. So this is uh, on the lower side of my volume, so you can just see a part of this epiglottis, but please do not mix it with any pathology. So uh, there's uh, soft uh, tissues visible in uh, this uh, sagittal CBCT image. And since the patient uh, kept the tongue away from the heart palate, there is a large collection of air in the oral cavity. And against this air-filled oral cavity, we can see uh, the, uh, the tongue surface. And uh, when the patient puts the tongue against heart palate, uh, we can see the difference uh, in CBCT be between these two soft tissue structures. And so uh, this is air in the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and this is the level of hypopharynx. And so uh, also soft palate was visible in this patient. You can see some saliva in the oral cavity as well. For, uh, apart from uh, nutritive canals, uh, we've got also canals for normal, regular, large branches of uh, arteries and veins and nerves uh, in uh, the uh, oral uh, cavity. And um, in the anterior part of maxilla, we are sometimes uh, confronted with uh, a canal uh, which runs along uh, the nasal cavity uh, lateral wall. And it's the canal for anterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels. And I quite surprised my very good colleague, uh, who's a radiologist. We used to work together in medical radiology, and then we split. So I shifted to DMFR and my colleague to oncological radiology. But he's also a professor in anatomy. So when I started with cone beam and I started seeing this structure, which was not marked in uh, atlases of um, uh, radiological anatomy, I asked him whatever it, this was. And he said, I don't know. I can't see it in CT, in medical CT. So from anatomy, we followed this is the canal for anterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels. Uh, when you perform a CBCT taking into account also sphenoid bone, please do not forget about pterygopelatine fossa. This is the fossa which is uh, located posterior to maxillary sinus. And uh, it doesn't look very impressive. It's quite small. But uh, when we look at the content of <clears throat> pterygopelatine fossa, we understand that it's very important because it uh, contains maxillary nerve, maxillary artery, pterygopalatine ganglion, but it's also like 
crossroads, like a highway uh, between uh, the, the skull and uh, the soft tissues of the face. So uh, we've got uh, connections. Um, pterygoid maxillary fissure containing maxillary artery connects with infratemporal fossa. Sphenopalatine foramen containing sphenopalatine artery and posterior superior nasal branches leads to nasal cavity. Inferior orbital fissure connects with orbits. Foramen rotundum uh, containing the maxillary nerve leads to the middle cranial fossa. Pterygoid canal, also called Vedian canal, containing Vedian nerve leads to outer and inner surface of the skull. And greater palatine canal contains greater palatine nerve and blood vessels connects with oral uh, cavity. So uh, if anything happens uh, in this, uh, um, in this um, pterygopalatine fossa, uh, it can be like perineural spread of cancer. So if you see some kind of pathology enlargement of this uh, fossa, uh, loss of cortical uh, plates of this fossa, please think large, think about something outside dentistry, think about tumor, maybe you can save your patient's life. What else is important? Um, from anatomy which is not directly related to anatomy to implant planning uh, it's also styloid process of temporal bone i will get back to this issue a little bit uh, later i just wanted to show you how confusing some images can be this is cbct but this is a reconstruction reconstruction of a wider slice of CBCT uh, volume showing a condylar head, condylar neck, ramus of a mandible, styloid process of temporal bone and cervical spine. But when we go back, when we go just to single slice, it's all very confusing. Uh, in fact, this cross section of cervical spine uh, looked to someone like um, condylar head, and it does look like condylar head, but when we get the complete picture, we are not misled. And um, depending on uh, the software, it's easier or less easy to demonstrate the styloid process and its elongation. The mastoid process of uh, temporal bone is, of course, again, not the main focus of interest. Uh, in implant planning, but if you go for large field of view, you can also see the mastoid process and in case it's inflamed, the air cells will be opacified, so this should be reported as well. Apart from anatomical considerations uh, regarding anatomical landmarks, there is also a very important issue of assessment of bone quality uh, before implant uh, placement. And as you know, in medical CT, the so-called Hounsfield units are used, and these are the units uh, which relate uh, the um, degree of attenuation, linear coefficients of attenuation of X-ray beam and CT in um, individual slices to the grayscale uh, of the screen. And in this basic uh, Hounsfield um, scale, a uh, value of plus 1000 is related to dense structures such as cortical bone, and minus 1000 is the air, uh, mi mi minus 1024 exactly, and zero corresponds to water. So in general, uh, these uh, densities are used to distinguish between uh, structures, like you have something which is hypodense, looks black uh, on CT image, but if it's minus 1000, it's the air, like for example, air bubble between muscles uh, after trauma or after extraction of a tooth, but if it's Hypodense, so looking, let's say, black, but the density is minus 100, minus 150, you know it's fat tissue. And this density can be uh, used uh, to assess the density of a bone before implant placement. And uh, Hounsfield units proved to be um, very uh, useful in medical 
uh, diagnostics and um, the repeatability of measurements is satisfactory. What about cold beam CT? Well, you already know that I do not recommend medical CT for all implant uh, planning because of high dose. I recommend uh, uh, I recommend uh, the um, CBCT machines, but. Uh, what about these density measurements? This is example of density measurements in a medical CT. So uh, you've got the minimum, maximum, and mean value within the field of view. And can you perform such measurements in CBCT? Yes, you can perform uh, as well, but at this moment still mm, the uh, standard deviation of measurements in CBCT is bigger than in medical CT. So what do we do? Of course, uh, we can um, assess bone quality by looking at the structure of a bone. And this is this basic uh, scale from D1 to D4, um, comparing to different types of wood. And um, the best one is, of course, D2 type with thick uh, cortex, but um, normal, regular uh, sponges bone not too sclerotic, so this one providing best primary stability of an implant. However, uh, this scale is very subjective, so evaluation is done only on the basis of uh, individual assessments uh, of a person um, interpreting the CBCT uh, scan. What can we do? Uh, can we use cone beam for uh, evaluation of Hounsfield units? Um, back in 2012, a group of colleagues uh, from Brazil said that uh, bone density in Hounsfield unit with CBCT images obtained using uh, the studied scanner proved unreliable since it was higher than using multi slice CBCT. Uh, colleagues from ACTA in Amsterdam, Azin uh, and uh, Professor Understood with the other colleagues, they stated that gray levels from CBCT images are influenced by device and scanning settings, and this was published back in 2013. But again, I remind you, we are 2021 and everything pre uh, progresses, and now we have um, available density measurements in CBCT as well. And um, in, this, um, in this settings, uh, uh, we uh, use um, a kind uh, of um, roadmap around the implant, uh, which shows uh, both densities in house field units, but it's also very easy uh, to uh, see where the bone quality is good and where bone quality uh, is low, because the, yeah, the red color uh, points out to the areas with uh, low density. In this case, I placed an implant on purpose a little bit inside maxillary sinus so that you can see the areas uh, that are low density, uh, therefore highlighted with red color. But, um, currently, we are uh, we are running a study uh, in my university on uh, use of uh, these density uh, measurements. So hopefully, when we meet next time, I will be uh, able to provide you the results of the study. But um, as you uh, can see here, uh, at least. Um, and this is uh, very clear, uh, showing the low densities within uh, the airfield maxillary sinus. And uh, also my colleagues from ACTA in Amsterdam, they uh, published um, a paper on bone quality evaluation and dental implant sites, and they uh, compared uh, multi-slice computer tomography, CBCT, and micro-CT, which is golden standard in in vitro ex vivo studies for um, examination of bone uh, structure. And uh, they found uh, that there was a strong correlation between CBCT gray values and uh, the bone parameters uh, measured by um, micro CT, like bone volume fracture, fr fraction at implant site. So uh, there is potential use of uh, CBCT gray value estimation in bone quality assessment and implant sites. 
So now let's have a look at implant planning. Maybe I will go through it quite quickly. I'm sure that you are familiar uh, with diff different um, implants and the solutions for implant planning for the choice of implant for the placement of this virtual implant, um, possibility of moving the implant and adjusting the implant uh, to the side here also with this function for um, estimation of uh, bone quality before implantation. And now uh, for the last part uh, of my lecture for these risks uh, that uh, Alan mentioned, the risks uh, which are related to some findings uh, that are called incidental. So when you are focused just on implant placements, uh, you may uh, tend to uh, forget about some other lesions that can be diagnosed uh, within the CBCT volume. Of course, uh, the timeline of my lecture is not enough to tell you about everything that is found in uh, dental maxillofacial radiology, but I'm not going to talk today about uh, some rare tumors. I'm going to um, talk about some findings that are quite common, but um, can be missed. I underline this was stated by several uh, societies all over the world at least, but this one is more recent from 2019 from European Society of Endodontology. The entire volume of data must be assessed systematically in all three planes and reported. By whom? Well, this depends on local legal provisions. If there is a maxillofacial radiologist available, that's great. If not, by the clinician who has prescribed the examination. And all clinically relevant as well as incidental findings should be reported. So that's uh, like one of the emails I keep on getting from my colleagues and this one, uh, my colleague Andre, he said, hi, these are the x-rays of an older friend of mine. Do you know what's there in the mandible on the left side? Greetings. And yes, of course, I know this is a panoramic, but when I look at it, I know it immediately. This is Staphne bone cavity. Staphne defect, uh, which is like concavity on the lingual side of the mandible. It used to be connected with a salivary gland, uh, submandibular salivary gland, but not necessarily. It used to be connected with um, facial artery, especially in patients with hypertension, but we are not really sure about the etiology of um, this defect, but we know that this is not a tumor, this is not a, t uh, a cyst, this is just concavity on the inner aspect of mandibular body, in mostly in posterior mandible around the uh, mandibular angle under uh, mandibular nerve canal, and since it's um, very well limited, it looks like a cyst uh, into the radiographs. But important issue is that it does not grow. It does not change size. Uh, it's located typically under inferior alveolar nerve canal, which means that it's not um, pathology of dental origin. We just leave it alone. Uh, sometimes uh, this looks very, a little bit more fishy. Uh, in this patient, uh, the defect was large. In fact, he went for a medical CT and there was nothing in this defect, just fat tissue. So we also classified it as staphnet bone defect. And um, there is also anatomical variant, maybe less common, of anterior staphne. And this is already very important in implant planning because it reduces the lingual dimension of alveolar process in some patients to just a few millimeters. Um, another example, and uh, a couple of years ago, together with my Turkish friends, uh, we published uh, a paper on Stefna bone cavity in anterior mandible. Uh, at that time, we found 66 cases uh, published in literature in six of hours, uh, but uh, these cases keep on coming. Now that we perform more CBCT uh, volumes, uh, we see it more often. 
And um, there is also one incidental finding which uh, recently has contributed quite frequently uh, to the referrals for cone beam from my colleagues here in Poland. This is dense bone islands. Uh, usually dense bone is cortex bone around the sponges bone, but sometimes this is a little anatomical variant and dense bone is laid within a sponges bone. It's not related to um, the episodes of teeth. Um, then we can diagnose it as dense bone island. If it's uh, around uh, apex of the tooth and it's less obvious, then we have to differentiate it from sclerosing osteitis. And when it's larger, then um, I, I suggest follow up just in case uh, it's um, not dense bone island, but uh, bone dysplasia that could progress. And uh, we can be really misled by 2D radiographs. Uh, this is a radiograph, panoramic radiograph of a very nice lady who used to be resident in pediatric dentistry at the time. And she was a very good friend of one of my PhD students at the time. So she used to come to radiology. Um, and she was also very interested in uh, radiology. So once uh, she uh, had this uh, panoramic image, but uh, she uh, thought that she knew a lot about uh, radiology. So she found a lesion under mandibular nerve canal. So she diagnosed it as um, dense bone island. And she was most importantly asymptomatic. And, um, and sometime later, uh, we had the new CBCT machine installed in our department and this lady, uh, she was interested as well and she volunteered for a test scan for, for CBCT and then we found out this was no dense bone island, but she had salivary stone, quite a large salivary stone, uh, one centimeter in diameter. Uh, you can see the layers uh, of accumulation of calcified material in this component. And how come she was asymptomatic? She came to me for ultrasound and this explained a lot. The stone was mobile, so it was like popping in and out of a hilum of submandibular gland. That's why it not, did not produce congestion and inflammation in the submandibular gland. And this is quite a recent case from a couple of days um, ago, patient for implant planning, you can see the tracing of mandibular nerve canal and again a large layered calculus in the course uh, of the submandibular duct on the right side. What else? Some uh, lesions uh, that also look sclerotic in the bone and this is periapical cemental dysplasia. Um, we've got three stages of this dysplasia and early stage radiolucency. Unfortunately, the lesions look like periapical granulomas and this is the reason why uh, many patients are necessarily treated by endodontics because these lesions will not resolve following endodontic treatment. Instead, they will progress with a natural course and the natural course is the position of a calcified material in this plastic bone. So in this form, in the mixed form, uh, it looks uh, the, the easiest, the most pathognomonic for um, uh, diagnosis as there is radiolucent lesion around the apex, most commonly lower incisors with calcified material spread inside the lesion. With time, it will progress to be completely opacified and then you have to differentiate from sclerotic osteitis as well as from uh, cementoblastoma, which is the only tumor in humans derived from um, dental uh, cement. There is one more finding which is frequent both in uh, panoramic radiographs and uh, CBCT. It's uh, even more widespread in CBCT because it's more visible than in um, panoramics and these are dystrophic calcifications in palatal tonsils. You observe them uh, in the parapharyngeal space and uh, prevalence is really high. What do you do about it? Nothing, you just leave it alone unless the calcifications are large and uh, cause halitosis, then they can be excised. 
Um, regarding panoramic radiographs, uh, they can be cast um, against the shadow of mandibular ramus, but they can be uh, found only higher up, as well as posterior to the mandibular ramus. And um, in panoramic radiographs, uh, these uh, calcifications also are responsible for excessive rates of um, diagnosing of salivary uh, calculus. And so uh, calm beam CT verifies the location of uh, the lesion in the parapharyngeal space. So as I mentioned, leave it alone, report, but leave it alone. And then um, sometimes I must say uh, that lesions are just too big to be picked up. So uh, when, um, when I look at um, a radiograph, um, I not do not necessarily look at all uh, the uh, details, only at the details, but I try to look from uh, a little bit bigger distance to get the complete picture. And this was uh, the, a case in which, uh, in fact, we almost missed a lesion. This was a patient for implant planning at that time, large field of view CBCT, and uh, the lesion was so big, it was a coenal polyp uh, in nasopharynx, so a polyp growing from the nasal cavity into uh, the pharynx, and it was so large, it blended in with uh, the shadow of uh, soft palate that we almost missed it because we focused on something else. So this is uh, to highlight the importance of looking at everything in, within the CBCT volume. And personally, when I report a CBCT, I start from the back. If it's like CBCT for an uh, uh, impacted canine, for a uh, tooth in, treated by endo, for implant planning, I do not start with impacted canine. I do not start with endodontic tooth. I do not start with implants. I start with everything else because otherwise when I focus on the lesion, I might forget about um, the, the other findings, especially when I have a lot of patients to be reported, when I don't have a lot of time, I don't want to miss anything. I have to be very, very cautious in um, um, reporting uh, the CBCDs because so many different findings uh, can be um, visible in these uh, volumes. What else can we see? We can see a flebolid, uh, which is a venous stone. So uh, venous stones um, are formed uh, in veins with a slow blood flow. They are quite normal, for example, for pelvis, for plexi in uh, pelvis, in abdomen, but they are not common in the maxillofacial skeleton. So if you observe any flebolids, which are like uh, targets, uh, calcifications, like ring-like calcifications, then uh, you uh, have to um, remember about the possibility that they can be linked with a lesion which is uh, potentially harmful to the patient, uh, such as cavernous hemangioma. This is um, a, t a tumor made of large compartments containing blood with slow flow, flow uh, where uh, these calcifications are formed. And for example, in this lady, the hemangioma concerned the area of uh, mediopterygoid muscle, and uh, she was asymptomatic. There were no signs on the cheek and uh, ENT examination. The mucosa of the pharynx was normal. And it was incidental finding in CBCT for and for other reason that she had this large hemangioma, which of course also has a threat of bleeding, massive bleeding. I'm sorry for the quality of this picture, but uh, it dates back uh, over uh, 15 years, or maybe not 15, around 13 years ago. And but it was a lady sent to us uh, from uh, another center. This was still analog film-based radiograph with a calcification uh, in the mandible. And um, we did CBCT and we found out the calcification was not in the mandible, but we also found the mesiodense, which was completely not visible in panoramic. So I, I was telling you panoramics to lie. 
Next, uh, this was also an uh, interesting incidental finding. Uh, it turned out to be pilomactrixoma, which is a very rare tumor uh, growing from hair follicle and calcified in the skin. So as you can see, panoramics can be very misleading and uh, CBCT tells you the exact position of the uh, lesion. I promised to come back to the issue of a styloid process of temporal bone. In some patients, elongated styloid process and calcified stylohyoid or stylomandibular ligaments can produce the whole so-called eagle syndrome because of compression on an internal carotid artery or a compression on the cranial nerves running in vicinity of this elongated complex. And this, these are to come um, to a classification by Langley. And then um, David McDonald, he also uh, provided his own more detailed classification of elongation of styloid process. But um, if it's over 35 millimeters, it's called elongated. Uh, this is this pseudo-articulate type with a styloid process and calcification of, of a ligament. And uh, it can be seen also in uh, CBCT. In this case, uh, this is um, only partially visible in the volume, but in the 3D reconstruction, the calcified portions of stylohyoid uh, uh, ligaments is very well visible. And it's important to diagnose the syndrome because the patients um, visit uh, different uh, kinds of specialists complaining of neural neuralgias and uh, they have like CT, MRI, and uh, EMT examination and nothing is found. And sometimes it's the dentist who is the first person to diagnose this elongation and compression of the nerves. And um, then the patients can be effectively treated. Uh, what else uh, we have to uh, look at? Um, well, the teeth and alveolar process, I told you, uh, you already have a look at it, but I uh, strongly advise you uh, to look at the complete picture. Well, this was a young patient for uh, orthodontic treatments, uh, but in this case, uh, we also looked at the sinuses, for example, in this case, a complete absence of a sphenoid, a sphenoid sinus. But we also observe uh, the measurements uh, of airway. Of course, this is a CBC taken in, in patient uh, standing. So the uh, real assessment for airway should be done in CBCT units in patients lying supine, uh, mimicking the position uh, for um, sleeping, uh, for uh, sleep uh, apnea. But um, this is now you know that uh, implant planning is uh, often combined uh, with orthodontic treatment to make space for uh, the implants, especially in patients uh, with hypodontia, like of uh, lateral upper incisors. It's also combined with periodontal treatments, so very complex treatments. And apart from just plain implant planning, we should also have a look at the bone. And um, only CBCT uh, with cross-sectional, uh, mostly cross-sectional slices will provide you information on the thickness of buccal and lingual cortical plates. And um, this will prevent uh, patients from developing uh, gingival recessions following orthodontics. Uh, this is really uh, unfortunate when the teeth are very nicely orthodontically aligned, but uh, recessions, the senses and fenestrations of the bone, uh, alveolar bone resulted in gingival recessions and these patients uh, require periodontal surgery. So this piece of assessment of CBCT is also important so that the orthodontists know which kinds of orthodontic movements should be uh, avoided during uh, treatment. And there's some um, Another case of the patient for implant planning, 
and uh, it was large field of view as BCT, so it also included cervical spine. And this is the level of uh, C2, the dense of C2 uh, vertebra, and this is anterior arch of C1 vertebra, and the patient has osteoarthritis. We've got narrowing of joint space, osteophytes, so uh, beaking um, outgrowth uh, on the surfaces uh, of um, the bone, uh, some uh, eli cysts, um, uh, subchondral cysts, and also subchondral sclerosis. So apart from uh, just dental findings, we observe findings also in cervical spine. Um, I was telling you about uh, all the things that we can diagnose by means of cone beam CT, but there are still some uh, limitations. These uh, limitations are um, also related to uh, artifacts. Of course, um, nowadays, uh, all the uh, all new software is focused on elimination of these uh, artifacts. I can read a lot of papers um, uh, on that uh, issue as uh, artifacts were considered one of more important limitations for CBCT diagnosis, for example, and diagnosis of um, fractures, especially uh, when we consider that uh, um, that teeth, um, apart from central incisors, are mostly fractured when they are already treated by endowear, when they are non-vital, when they have some big post spins, uh, which were um, placed with a high force, and this leads to uh, fractures of uh, the teeth. However, we are not very able to diagnose uh, these fractures because of uh, altru because of artifacts. In this case, uh, this looked like a fracture line. My colleague extracted the tooth, but the tooth was not fractured. It was just an artifact. So uh, the solution for these artifacts is, as mentioned, uh, filtering and uh, filters uh, that uh, can be found in CBCT are effective in the reduction of artifacts. At this moment, CBCT is still not indicated as a method for car carriers detection. As you know, the uh, radiographs of choice are um, bite-wing radiographs in adults and children and periapical paralleling, techni uh, by by uh, paralleling technique uh, periapicals. Panoramics are not indicated for diagnosis of dental caries, and so is uh, CBCT. Of course, if the patient doesn't have artifacts, so fillings, prosthetic devices, orthodontic appliances, implants, etc., then caries can be very nicely demonstrated, like histopathology specimen, you know, with this a small area of destruction in animal and large area undermining the uh, animal in the dentin. So really histopathology uh, specimen. But uh, if patients have uh, some fillings, uh, there, there are artifacts mimicking dental caries. And I can tell you that this patient, he didn't know, didn't have any recurrent caries, any residual caries. It was just artifacts. At this moment, CBCT is still not indicated as a routine method of imaging of periodontal bone support, but of course it can be used in complex cases, especially involvement of farcation, and um, it, it uh, shows you uh, clearly the differences on bone destruction on the palatal side and on the buccal side. Usually the palatal side is more affected, but 2D radiographs will present the level of the buccal bone. So again, it will the bone defect will be underestimated. CBCT is also not indicated at this moment in diagnosis of soft tissues. This is a young patient which was uh, suspected of a, a pulse, but the biopsy revealed that it was carcinoma in such a young male. So of course, CBCT presents bone destruction, but the extent of soft tissue lesion was not um, clear. And 
this is um, an example of a patient uh, which uh, is um, like a warning light uh, again once again to underline that the complete volume must be assessed. This patient first uh, showed up at the age of 29 years uh, for extraction of uh, lower right third molar. Everything was fine at that time. Everything was fine. But when he visited us five years later, he already came in this state following resection of almost whole mandible due to tumor and uh, bone grafting and he came for implant planning. So I started implant planning, you know, it was not very great because the height of this bone graft was not very big, it was around one centimeter, but still, of course, uh, we should help this patient. He's a young male. Uh, he would like to live normal life. Uh, so prosthetic um, implants and uh, prosthetic appliance uh, should be a nice solution for him. But I started looking at the volume and I didn't like this area. I definitely didn't like this area. I compared the ramus on the left side with the ramus on the right side. There was loss of cortical bone. So I reported it and I said, of course, it could be uh, osteomyelitis, but I also uh, reported this could be a relapse of a tumor. And the patient was sent for medical CT. And unfortunately, it was massive, massive relapse of the tumor, infiltrating oral floor. And the patient was referred immediately again for oncological treatment. So I was very sorry for him because he thought uh, that he was uh, already healthy, he was hoping for implants, he was hoping for a normal life, but instead he ended up with um, treatment and um, the tumor progressed uh, despite treatment, it was very malignant sarcoma. I will not tell you the histopathology result because it was changed several times basing on uh, different uh, uh, histopathological uh, methods used, but uh, um, as, as mentioned, it was very aggressive. Uh, two more, and this is the last CT that I have of this patient from this uh, October uh, 2019, and I know that he died in uh, January 2020. So um, sometimes, as you can see, less is more. Uh, you, uh, you are the ones to decide on the size of CBCD, as, a, as I told you in the beginning of our meeting. Um, I strongly recommend small field of view. However, sometimes uh, it may, may not be uh, this way. This is a male patient following extraction uh, of a tooth and the dentist, he um, asked for a small field of view. Then when we retook uh, with um, a larger field of view, only then we could see the extraction site and um, the extraction socket was cropped and we could not see uh, the fracture which was suspected. Instead, uh, a um, nutritive canal was confused with a fracture. And one month later, he was followed up with a large field of view CBCT and only then the fracture of the mandible related to the extraction site was uh, visible. So um, as mentioned, small field of view is recommended, but also the positioning of the volume is crucial in demonstrating the lesion. So this was the, uh, this was the fracture and not uh, the nutritive canal visible uh, previously. And um, I guess that uh, nowadays uh, the lectures tend to be finished with a take home message, something that can be applied by you from Monday on in your dental offices. So uh, my um, take home message uh, will be uh, this picture uh, taken surprisingly uh, in the toilets in a hotel in the Caribbean island of Cuba where I saw uh, the sentence so very dear to radiologists all over the world. The eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. And my mind was not prepared to, to find 
this sentence in Cuba in toilet made by the cleaning lady. So I asked her about it, how come she did it? And she said that uh, she has a little book with different uh, sentences and every evening she prepares a different one from flowers. Of course, she was uh, waiting for some tips and I gave her, uh, I gave her uh, a tip for, for taking this, this picture. So um, this is very true. And I can tell you why basing on this example. This is a CPCT taken in August 2018. Very clear, very clear picture. Mesiodens uh, in, incorrectly uh, located central incisors because of this mesiodens which erupted. A very straightforward extraction of mesiodens orthodontic treatment. But the patient had panoramic radiograph more than two years late, uh, earlier. And in this panoramic, we can already see the mesiodens. We can see the incisors. We can see the problem with eruption of left central incisor because it's rotated by 90 degrees. But the mind of a doctor who took this panoramic did not see the possibility of mesiodens. Most probably, he treated it as a central primary left upper incisor. So back then it could have been extracted. Back then maybe orthodontic treatments would not have been so extensive because of natural progress of eruption of these teeth and uh, without the mesiodens, without the, the obstacle in eruption, maybe uh, the central incisor would have erupted correctly. So the conclusion, the take home message, in order to see something in uh, radiology, in CBCT, you must be aware of a plethora of uh, imaging findings. You must know characteristic images. And then once you know it, you know where to look for. Your mind will be prepared to see the lesions. So I was very happy to be able to be with you. I can't see you because in this version of Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar, I can see only the panelists, but I'm sure uh, that, uh, that it would be very nice to see you as well. And now I will, will stop sharing uh, my presentation. I will just provide you with my uh, email in case you have more questions. I see that there is only one activity at this uh, uh, moment uh, in the question and answer box. Okay, thank you.